what I consider to be one of the most important projects undertaken by the College of Staten Island, and that is uh, the opening of, of the Willowbrook Mile. Uh, I think everyone here knows the contributions that Mike Cusick has made to this borough. Uh, you know, his uh, generous support of the Willowbrook Mile is just an, another example of his invaluable service uh, to the college, but also to the entire uh, borough and the, and the Staten Island community. So thank you, Assemblyman Cusick. Um, additionally, I want to thank a, a, a number of people today, uh, especially Geraldo Rivera, uh, for being here with us, who will be a speaker. Um, you know, uh, Cheryl Minter Brooks was uh, was on uh, earlier draft of the program, but uh, wrote this morning that she had a, a last minute uh, uh, conflict in her schedule. And uh, likewise, uh, Ted Brown, uh, you know, sends his uh, re regrets uh, that that he won't be able to be here today. And and of course, uh, Diane uh, Biglioli, the co-chair of the Willowbrook uh, Mile Committee, and especially to Professor David Good. Uh, you know, David, uh, you know, your book, I think, has really been instrumental in, in, you know, bringing awareness of the events of Willowbrook back to the awareness, at least of the, of the college community, if not uh, the national uh, audience, and of course, Michael, uh, Professor Michael Kress uh, that, that I just mentioned. So today's uh, place could not have taken uh, place without everyone that I've mentioned, hard work and support. Uh, but I also want to thank uh, the dedicated uh, staff from the economic uh, development area, Nora Santiago and Tim Smolka, the staff of the President's Office, especially uh, Debbie Mahoney and Manny Gonzalez, uh, the staff of the Vice President for Advancement, uh, uh, my Deputy and Chief of Staff, and uh, you know, soon to be our new uh, uh, Vice President for Economic Development, Ken Awama. You know, all of them and probably many, many others uh, worked hard. You know, an event like this doesn't just happen. It, it takes a lot of hard work behind the scenes. But most of all, I want to thank you in the audience. Uh, uh, you know, I think everyone here in the audience, by being here, has really signaled that you've dedicated your lives to helping others. And uh, you know, and and you, those of here in the audience today, are remaining vigilant in ensuring that the systematic warehousing of people with intellectual and developmental uh, disabilities through institutionalization will never happen again. Uh, you're ensuring that Willowbrook as a seminal point in history leading to the greater protection for the rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is never forgotten. Um, you know, a little over two years ago I started uh, speaking more about the college's legacy. And I started out talking about the legacy of history. And so the history of the college starts with our humble beginnings at Staten Island Community College in 1956 at 50 Bay Street, uh, the first public institution of higher education in the borough, to the establishment of Richmond College in 1967 at 130 Stuyvesant Place, which was an innovative and experimental uh, upper division and uh, master's uh, institution, uh, to the merger of the institutions in 1976 to become the College of Staten Island, and then eventually move here to Willowbrook in 1993. So that's the legacy uh, of, of our history. But recently, I've started talking about our legacy of place. And so place means, you know, what, are, what is the historical legacy of our current campus, which is Willowbrook. And so that legacy, you know, we feel like we're the stewards and the custodian of a legacy that goes, you know, back much further than the, the history of the college. And so the legacy of place really starts out from this area of being bucolic farmland, uh, you, know, you know, going to way back uh, turn of the century and, and before was recognized as being one of the more beautiful spots on Staten Island with the farm land. Uh, part of the story that's been forgotten is Halloran General Hospital, which stood where our great lawn is today, was written about in the New York Times as being one of the most uh, Advanced uh, general, uh, advanced hospital in the United States with the most advanced surgical uh, techniques. It, uh, you know, treated I think something like 180,000 uh, servicemen during World War II, and then either sent them back to the front or home, depending on on their conditions. And then I just heard today that it uh, actually had one of the earliest uh, TV uh, receivers. Uh, you know, for the servicemen that were housed there and special broadcasts uh, to Staten Island just for the servicemen so they could watch sporting events from, 
from uh, Manhattan. I only learned that this morning. So, so and of course, then the transition from Heller and General Hospital to the Willowbrook State School, and then eventually to the College of Staten Island. So, the college understands the importance of our history. You know, both the good and the bad part of that history. Uh, you know, the often repeated uh, phrase, you know, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, I think is an admonition that's uh, particularly relevant uh, to us here at Willowbrook. Uh, for us, Willowbrook is the nexus of the beginning of the civil rights movement for people with uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, and just think about it. I think that you can draw a straight line. It isn't even a stretch. You can draw a straight line from the Willowbrook Consent Decree to the federal uh, legislation of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. So, you know, on our grounds were the beginning of what I consider to be some of the most important civil rights legislation in the history of the nation, if not the world. And I think it's our solemn uh, duty as custodians of that uh, history of, uh, to see that this legislation is continued and enhanced and that the conditions of uh, Willowbrook will never again uh, reappear in our nation. And so I think collectively I, I feel safe in saying that, it, that as a college community, as a community of people uh, that are gathered here, we stand against the tyranny of institutionalization. Um, you know, and there are some many ways that the college has honored that transition and, and you know, it's just sort of happened organically, but we're really trying to give more, more uh, focus to it. Uh, we serve the largest uh, a number of students, the highest percentage of our student body of any of the CUNY uh, campuses. We have over uh, 300 students with disability, including uh, over 70 with autism that are, are pursuing you know, all of our majors and succeeding at uh, very high levels are very much a, a part of our college community. You know, we have a disability studies uh, emphasis uh, to many of our uh, social science uh, programs. Uh, we have a, a newly accredited social work program and includes a master of social work with a focus on care for people with disabilities. We think it's one of the first in the nation uh, to have that particular focus to it, to an MSW uh, uh, program. Uh, we have a lecture series that was generously supported by Geraldo Rivera. Geraldo, thank you for, and, and that lecture series is designed to bring in uh, people from across the nation to examine and shape policy with respect to the care for people with disabilities. Uh, we have students uh, with the CUNY Service Corps that have been interning at Lifestyles and our neuroscience uh, faculty have many uh, collaborations uh, with the scientists at, at IBR. So, and, I, and I'm probably missing every time you go through a list, you miss programs. But I, I just want to emphasize that I think organically we've had a very rich and a very deep uh, connection with that Willowbrook uh, legacy, and, and today is about uh, celebrating that. So today we join with our neighbors, the various offices and uh, programs of the New York State uh, Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, the Staten Island uh, Developmental Disability Services offices, of course, uh, IBR Lifestyles, the Elizabeth Conley uh, Resource Center, in opening the Willowbrook Mile in a, in a symbolic uh, removing of the barriers among our institutions and uniting with a common purpose. And of course, those members here today from the SIDDC have been, uh, you know, you know, equally, uh, you know, vigilant and with the with the legacy and and, and making uh, today's event happen. So former United States Senator Paul Songus once says, we are a continuum, and just as we reach back to our ancestors for fundamental values, so we, as guardians of that legacy, must reach ahead to our children and their children, and we do so with a sense of sacredness in that reaching. So in closing, I want to thank all of you for serving as guardians of that Willowbrook legacy. Thank you. You know, this is a long time coming, uh, this event. I want to thank, uh, again, I want to thank the college. I want to thank Dr. Fritz and his staff uh, for putting this uh, together. I want to thank the Willowbrook Mile Committee. Um, I know that uh, Diane is here, Lorraine. Uh, I know that uh, there are many others uh, who are here that have been championing this uh, great project for almost a decade, uh, I would say. 
uh, and it is something that uh, I am, I want to thank you for involving me in. Uh, as Dr. Fritz uh, so delicately had mentioned, um, yes, I'm the guy who had the money. Um, but again, I remind people at these things, it's not my money. You know, it, it, it's the money of the people of the state of New York. I am just entrusted by the people who elect me to use that money in very good ways. And this, when I was approached, this is definitely something that I thought that we should be funding uh, be, for many reasons. Um, you know, there are many reasons why we should have this Willowbrook Mile. And one that is very important is to make sure that people remember the history of this campus and the surrounding campuses. What this was, you know, it's. I know many of you have been here with me when I've had colleagues here. And the first thing I'll ask a colleague who's from, not from Staten Island or New York City, I'll ask them, do you know where you are? And they'll look around and they'll say, yeah, the College of Staten Island, Institute of Basic Research. Now, and these are folks who, who've been around, let's just say they've been around a lot longer than I have. Um, and I'll say, yeah, you're right, but do you know what this used to be? Now, one of them would come up with the answer. So then I would help them and say, this was Willowbrook. And one individual uh, who is the, the, the chair of the mental health committee, she was stunned because people who did not live it here on Staten Island knew of it thanks to people like Geraldo Rivera and people who made this a national issue. But to see it now is amazing. And, and it is, as Dr. Fritz said, it's the natural progression of this area. And it, what a more fitting place to have the College of Staten Island but on the grounds of Willowbrook. And so that's why it's very important for me, as Mike Kress had mentioned, I would not be in politics. I would not be in government if it weren't for the three individuals that Mike Kress had mentioned. Yes, two of them are Democrats, and I'm a Democrat, but, the, but John Markey, who's a Republican, was someone that I strive that I wish I could be a third of the legislator that those three individuals were, particularly when it comes to issues protecting those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it's not a lie when I say I would not be in elective office if it weren't for Betty Conley, and all of you are probably sick of hearing me say that. But I literally grew up in politics with the Conleys. And I know that she is very proud right now of all of you for this project that we are going to start today. Because it's very important, and I know that what she wanted people, more than closing Willowbrook, and more than taking care of those who were institutionalized, she wanted to make sure that the future generations knew exactly what happened here and what is happening presently and in the future. And it's her legacy, I believe, that lives on with a project like this. So again, I want to thank all involved because this will not only educate the students who go to the College of Staten Island, any folks in the community who come by here, they can learn the history as they get fit, which I think is a great component of this Willowbrook Mile. And so, on behalf of the people I represent, on behalf of the Conley family, I'm sure the Vitalianos and Senator Markey, I want to thank all of you for your hard work because now everyone will see the vision. Everybody will see the history. And that's what brings us all together as a community. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to look out and see so many people from all different areas, um, there are students and people from the college, individuals from lifestyles, small faces, 
of good friends, and uh, it's uh, been a long time in coming. Um, thank you for those kind words, <clears throat> Michael. I am well aware that almost all worthwhile accomplishments require the participation of many people. First, I am the proud co-chair with Lorraine DeSantis of the Staten Island Developmental Disabilities Council's Willowbrook Property Planning Committee. On behalf of Lorraine and I, I want to thank all of the committee members for the sincere and sustained efforts. You know, we generally say, hip hip. Hooray! Hooray! Yeah, that's right. You know, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but for this mile, it took so much more than a village. The Willowbrook Committee had conducted surveys, held forums, and panel discussions, consulted with architects and lawyers over the past 10 years. The original plan was to develop services on the excess Willowbrook property, including a center of excellence, which would be home to a crisis intervention center, sleepaway campsites, and a media resource center. During that decade, issues of both funding and topography required drastic changes to that plan. The council's committee continued to monitor and nurture the project, processing all that was learned and felt about the Willowbrook experience. We then realized that we needed to accept the transformation that was happening and trust the process. Allow it to morph into something that would endure, something that would ensure that the property would reflect that which it had never represented in the past, inclusion, productivity, progress, collaboration, and creativity. Our mission began, became to share the message and ensure its disposition to all those who would listen. Remember the past in order to protect the future. Simply said, never forget and never again. And thus the Wilbrook Mile, after a number more years, as an educational interactive walking trail equipped with visual and auditory kiosks, was born. So here we are today at the College of Staten Island on the former Willowbrook grounds. This wonderful college is a progressive educational setting producing our thinkers and leaders for future generations. We must acknowledge and offer our heartfelt thanks and appreciation to President Fritz and Michael Kress. Their entry into this journey ultimately facilitated and ensured that this day would occur. Their commitment to the mile and its message reinforced their position as crucial and primary stakeholders of the project. With the energized support of both the college and the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, as well as Assemblyman Michael Cusick and his belief in and funding for the project over so many years, Michael, thank you, this collaboration will soar, surely soar to reach its goal, not just the groundbreaking today, but the opening of the actual mile. The mile will ensure that people feel the texture of all that happened here. Each of the stations will give visitors an opportunity to study and understand all of the facets that comprise the history and experience of Willowbrook. The walkers of the mile will also learn about the gladiators who fought the good fight, including some who are here today with us or represented by their family, namely Geraldo Rivera, Murray Schnepps, and Assemblywoman Connolly. And of course, one of my favorite gladiators, Bernard Carabello. Geraldo, Murray, Betty's family, and Bernard, we are all so thankful for your efforts. On behalf of all of us and all the people of all varied levels of abilities who will follow, thank you. I have a, go ahead, feel free. I have a personal connection to this property. I worked here. On my first day of work at Willowbrook State School in 1969, I was handed this steel key. I see now. I don't think you can have a sense of the uh, get a sense of the, the the strength of that key. I was 19 years old. I had one and a half years of college and no experience at all with people with disabilities. Excited for my first day in a real job, I walked wide-eyed and eager to my assigned building. I approached the front door, which was a steel door requiring the steel key to open it. It was the heaviest door I had ever opened in my life. I entered the foyer area to be met with another steel door. As I opened the second steel door, I noticed in the top one-third of the door, there was a small rectangular window covered with a steel mesh that could not be seen through. The floors were like marble. They were dark, and they felt cold and hard under my feet. The walls were monochromatic and kind of drab. I unlocked that door 
and I walked into a hallway. As I walked the hallway, every door was locked, and I began to wonder, what have I gotten myself into? Maybe this was not such a good idea. And then I got to the third steel door, and I finally thought, who are behind these doors? Am I safe? Who is it that requires to be secured behind so many locked steel doors? I took a deep breath and unlocked and pushed open the final door and found behind it 40 toddlers. <clears throat> some smiling, some asking me my name, others were silent just looking at me. Some walked towards me, some were lying in wooden carts, and some were sitting on the floor. But they all shared one undeniable truth. They were all little children. To this day, I can still feel the twinge in my stomach, thinking to myself, why are these kids locked behind these doors? That surreal vision remains with me each day, and each time I advocate people with disabilities. Having seen such injustice, one must ensure it is not repeated. No one should be isolated, deprived of care, and the tools to thrive and live a productive life simply because they require some assistance to do so. The Willowbrook Mile is dedicated to all the people whose lives were affected by Willowbrook State School. Those who lived there, their families, those who worked there, and those who made the tireless and challenging journey to finally close it. We take this moment to acknowledge the amazing resilience of the human spirit, the remarkable journey made by those people challenged by placement into an institutional setting who soared beyond that injustice to thrive once freed to return to life in the community. There is an African saying that I like so much. When you pray, move your feet. You can pray to the heavens and request assistance, but saying but the saying suggests you should take action as well. Move your feet to ensure you are moving towards your goal. Thank you for participating in today's introduction of the Willowbrook Mile. Please pass its message forward that all lives are valuable and every person must be responsible to ensure that such disregard for person's humanity is never repeated. Inaction against injustice is as deep a cut as the actual injustice itself. Move your feet and walk the mile. Open up your mind and heart to feel its message and pass that message forward in both conscience and action. Thank you so much. I have some prepared remarks. Some of them will be a little repetitive because I think many of the ideas people think about today you know, uh, are similar, and rightly so. Uh, Wilbrook State School was closed in 1987, and uh, the last residents uh, officially uh, left here on September 17th, so three days from now. Uh, I have to say that when I got here in 93, there were still some of them wandering the campus. They lived off campus, and uh, I got to meet a number of them. They'd come to visit me in my office. Um, it was really a wonderful experience because I came here uh, interested in Willowbrook and writing about it. and I have been uh, investigating uh, since I've been here 25 years in Willowbrook State School. Uh, this day represents the most important historic event in terms of the uh, of Willowbrook occupying its proper place in history. And uh, the college, uh, I think, you know, deserves a lot of uh, uh, credit for what it's done. Uh, it, it, it's taken a while, and people have said it's taken a while, but when you think about it, the Holocaust Museum really opened in 1993, the U.S. Holocaust Museum. That's almost 50 years after the war, and I think it just takes time for society to come to grips with some of the things that it needs to acknowledge, you know, and, and uh, uh, so that, you know, maybe personally there have been people who have been frustrated. I think many of us have been who have been advocating, but uh, really, uh, in a way, it's understandable that it might have taken this long, and it's just important to, that it has happened, not that it took long or not long. Uh, some of you know that I wrote a book, we've uh, been talking about that, uh, with Daryl Hill, uh, my colleague, I'm not sure where he is, and also with, with Bill Bronston, who was a very active person here, and Gene Reese, who 
who uh, worked here for many years. And uh, you should read that book because there's a lot of detail in it about what life was like here at Willowbrook. I think that's the one thing that may be different about my book than others. And there will be other books to follow. Willowbrook is such a rich place. I know personally of at least two books now that are going to come out in the near future about Willowbrook. So it's a, it, it, it has a kind of sustenance to it. Um, and I, of course, I do want to acknowledge uh, President Fritz and the administration. I think you know a real change happened when he came uh, to the college, and uh, it, it, a lot of this is due to his his leadership. So this is a wonderful day in many regards. I'm going to read this part. <laughs> Hal knows why I'm reading it. Uh, we should feel a sense of achievement and even optimism about the way CSI will deal with the Willowbrook in the future. At the same time, it would be improper to rest on this beginning. The Willowbrook Mile cooperation between CSI and the disability community on Staten Island is a historic step in the right direction, but the fight against the forces that created places like Willowbrook continues and perhaps will always continue. Courts and communities are and will continue to struggle against them, for certainly one of the most important lessons learned from the history of Willowbrook State School is that citizens must be ever vigilant in protecting the rights of the most vulnerable among us, for they are the harbingers of us, of us all. In addition to our celebration, all gathered here today must remember the constant vigilance that comes in saying, with conviction, never again. So, as, as Diane said, we've got to move up. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Dr. Fritz really has changed the world, and I, uh, I so admire what he has done here. Assemblyman, thank you for the state support. Diane, you know, you know I go back all, all the way. Murray Schnepps, wherever he is uh, sitting, uh, original parents here, and he did so much uh, to bring me and uh, the cameras of Eyewitness News here. Bernard, I think, is really, I mean, for the young younger people here, uh, in, in so many ways, his life, I mean, he's, he's lived his life, he's a regular, tax-paying, uh, you know, New Yorker, he deals with, uh, you know, commuter traffic and all the other hassles that everybody else that works in the big city deals with. Uh, you know, his apartment, sometimes the elevator is late, this, that, and the other thing. The amazing thing is how normal his life is. I think it was uh, Diane mentioned the word resilience. The resilience of the human spirit, once given a chance, once given a chance to be normal, is extraordinary. Bernard lived here from the age of three years old yeah. until... There, there he lived, the age of three years old until his 21st birthday, which is when I met him, which is part of the reason I, I came here. We rendezvoused as soon as he got out, Dr. Bronson, uh, Bill Bronson, and uh, Mike Wilkins uh, helped uh, get him out of here, check him out. When he was 21, he legally could, uh, could leave on his own volition. He did. And we went to some diner, I remember, not, not far away. Tina's, Tina's, Tina's diner. diner. Tina's diner. And I interviewed Bernard and... Uh, uh, you know, you remember the one word you used to describe the conditions here? Disgusting, Disgusting is one word, deplorable another. Uh, Diane began to allude to it. Mike gets emotional speaking about it. I, I can hardly talk about it all these years later, almost 45 years later, because it still weighs on my psyche, on my heart so deeply. I mean, there's scarcely, I, I used to think about it every day. I don't think about it every day. I think about it every, every other day, every third day. I think about it an awful lot, uh, what, what was going on here and what was exposed and how the world began to change in January 1972. As Dr. Fritz points out, that the fence we jumped over, eyewitness news cameras, was right around here. So I think that that's, a, that's also appropriate that the, uh, the commemorative mile uh, begins here. It was a nightmarish place, one of the largest in the world, right in the city of New York, to think of thousands and thousands from the age of toddlers like Bernard was when he came uh, to the old timers. And what was an old timer? In those days, the life expectancy was probably in the 30s and 40s. Uh, you know, Bernard now is not as old as me, but he's uh, deep, in, deep into retirement age, <laughs> talking about how that's going to work out. But, I mean, they, they were warehousing people with disabilities here. They were getting them out of sight. They were, in many ways, turning their back on the most vulnerable population 
rather than caring for them, what they were really doing was freeing their families and their friends and their parents and everyone else from the burden of having to deal with a person with developmental disabilities. It was dehumanizing in many ways. It was, it, it, it was like a kennel. It was horrifying. I mean, the smells and the crowding and the, and the absolutely overwhelmed attendance and how they had to deal with it. And how it took, even with the stunning success in terms of the emotional impact of the original exposés, it still took 15 long years, from 1972 until 1987, and the consent decree for Willowbrook finally to be deinstitutionalized for this process, this process of humanizing the care and treatment and living conditions of the developmentally disabled population really took hold. Fifteen long years. That's how long the institution with, uh, with all of the, the hierarchy and the union situation and the state government situation, that's how long it took for the bureaucracy to catch up with what everybody agreed was necessary to care for and provide services for the developmentally disabled that are roughly equal to the services provided to the able-bodied population. Things, remember, there, there weren't even sidewalk ramps uh, back in those days if you were you know, wheelchair uh, bound. Uh, there was, it was very little in terms of, unless you're extremely wealthy, in terms of one-to-one -one care, community-based residences. Those barely existed back in those dark ages. You know, uh, uh, David Good, who has done such a fabulous job in preserving the history, mentions the Holocaust Museum. What was going on here wasn't a Holocaust. I don't think anything can compare to the, uh, the enormity of, uh, of uh, Western civilization using uh, the mechanized means at its disposal to wipe out a race of people. But the conditions in these wards, I submit that David is, is correct. It was concentration camp-like. That's, that's how bad it was, and that's why those of us who, uh, who saw that then are scarred forever by the experience. But there is also a celebration, the celebration of the recognition of the resilience of the population, of how much human potential was being squandered inside these dank, bare walls of these, of, inst of these institutions. You see, look around. Here in the student body, here working in the media, here doing all kinds of jobs of the population that uh, in those days barely emerged from the shadows. Even parents barely came to visit at times. So we celebrate everything that has changed. But we celebrate it, and as we do, we remember. That's why I am so delighted to be here on this morning that you commemorate the Willowbrook Mile. I look forward to it. I have not seen it myself. Bernard and I uh, are eager uh, to see how those moments have been commemorated or memorialized. I have no doubt, but with great, uh, great taste and with a powerful message. I want to thank you for inviting me and, and Bernard this morning. I promise you that as long as I'm breathing, I will stay associated with the College of Staten Island. I applaud everything that they have done to remember the roots of this place. Thank you very, very much.